Um, hello, and welcome to an introduction to the new input system. Uh, yes, it's finally here. It's real. Uh, after UGUI and nested prefabs, we present you long in the coming project number three, uh, the new input system. Uh, I'm Renee, lead developer on the input team here at Unity, and I'd like, in this talk, I'd like to give you a comprehensive overview of the new system. The goal here basically is to give you a solid idea of what's there, how it may be useful to you, and uh, where to find more information if you want to go and have a deeper look. So let's go and dive in. So let's first look at where we are as of today. Um, 1.0 preview is out now as a package. What that means is that you can install it in your project separately from the package manager UI inside of Unity. It still has the preview text, so in order to see it, you actually, like, you need to go into that little um, drop-down called advanced and uh, enable show preview packages, uh, and then it should show up. When you install it for the first time, uh, you will see a little dialog box that asks you to, uh, whether the new input backend should be enabled. You say yes, you have to restart the editor once, and that's it, you're good to go. Um, so the reason here is that we developed the new input system side by side, uh, to list side by side with the old one for now, uh, means it's completely optional. Uh, it's your choice, and you can even like, enable both at the same time. You know, that's not extensively tested. You may run into issues there. Um, in terms of features, um, 1.0 preview is what we consider feature complete and what we intend to land as a verified package in 2020.1. Uh, meaning, by that point, it fully becomes like an officially sanctioned and integrated part of Unity. Um, between here and Verify, there will still be bug fixes and some polishing on the docs and stuff like that, but we uh, intend to not like land any bigger changes between here and there. Uh, by the way, by feature complete, uh, we don't mean that that's it, everything's there. Rather, what we mean is that we think it's a viable system as a 1.0 uh, to ship a variety of applications on, but we know there's things it doesn't do yet, and that we wanted to do, and I'll circle back to that later in the talk. Um, so, at the moment, the minimum requirement for uh, the package is Unity 2019.1. We may move that up to 0.2, but we intend to support the 2019 line with the 1.0 release. Um, okay, so next, before moving on to looking at specific features, I'd like to take a quick look back on why we got here, like why did we develop a new input system in the first place? Um, one of the big problems with the existing input system in Unity is consistency. Uh, like part of Unity has, um, has always been about trying to reduce the pain of multi-platform development, and like with the old system, like to be frank, that pain was often not really reduced by all that much, if any. Um, like you could take the same controller, plug it in on Windows, plug it in on the Mac, and you get completely different button mappings, stuff like that. For the new input system, we wanted consistent behavior across platforms. Same device, same result. Um, also, if it's input, it should come in the same single way. In the old input system, joystick, gamepad, mouse, keyboard input uh, is separate from touch and separate from sensors and separate from tracking data. It's all input, but it's cast into incompatible APIs that have just grown their own separate ways over time. Uh, we want all these inputs to surface the same way. Also, we realized that with what's going on out there in terms of platforms and hardware and just sheer variety of use cases, uh, there's no way we can write one system that as is just fits the bill for everyone. So we knew that one of the key capabilities of any new system had to be that it's adaptable. Adaptable in that like, you can use its public APIs to uh, bend the system to your will. Um, the old input system made this one really hard. Uh, all the data that it had was like, uh, kept internally and processed internally, and all you saw was the end result, um, to the point where even bindings were only surfaced in the editor and not really changeable at runtime. Um, so from the get-go, we decided that we want to have only a very slim, platform-specific native C++ part in the Unity runtime, whose sole job is to just collect and forward all the data it has to an open source, um, managed code part uh, that sits in a package and that does all the processing out in the open. All the source data we operate on, you can see, you can alter, and even like make it up on the fly if you want to. But the um, thing is, with a new system that by nature now being a good deal more complex than the old one, we still wanted something that's easy to use, uh, something that you can 
get set up with in mere minutes. Uh, something that even though it offered an API that allows you to go really deep, at the same time had an API that allowed you to get started really quickly. So when we looked at all these things back then, we came to the conclusion there's really no fixing the old system uh, without rewriting it. So that's where we are. This is why the new input system is there and why it's, it is its own separate thing, completely uh, segregated from the old input system. Um, okay, that was a lot of words on the why. Next, I would like to take a look at the what. Um, and for that, I would like to do something a little different. Rather than me just like um, talking here through some slides, I would like to just um, introduce the three key building blocks and just like quickly run through some bullet points. And then for each one, do a live demo instead. I think that will, will be a bit more interesting than just slides. Um, so, first big building block is devices. Devices are the bread and butter of the new input system. They're basically the foundation of, upon which everything else is built. Each of them is just a bunch of controls, and I'll show you in a minute what this uh, actually means. Um, oh, that was uh, this point. By the way, this look, weird looking stuff up there on the right, um, these are API entry points. Uh, just for, like, in case you want to take a deeper look, um, this is just meant to, to get you started and give you some point to look into. And there's a couple slides that will have this like, weird text there in the upper right. Um, the way these devices are authored is based on a flexible data-driven layout system that you can use yourself to extend and or modify uh, device support however you want. Uh, that's the various register calls that you can see there. Um, finally, it's worth mentioning that input comes in as events. Events that you can listen to and intercept, uh, that you can put on disk or send over the wire and then and play back, uh, that you can generate yourself uh, if need be. Nothing is hidden away there. Um, also, just to mention that uh, uh, there's support for um, so, uh, sending data the opposite way, meaning from the application to the device. Uh, we call that device commands, and we use it for rumble and the kind of stuff, but it's uh, also, completely extensible, you can even author custom commands if you want. But let me actually switch over here and show you this in action. So this is a blank project in Unity, uh, in the latest beta of Unity. Uh, you can use whatever you want, like uh, from the 2019 line. All I did here was I installed the input system from the package manager. Um, restarted the editor, like here's the input system, restarted the editor, and that's where we are. Um, so, uh, the best way to look at devices is through the input debugger. And this is something that comes installed with the package. You can find it here in Window, Analysis, Input Debugger. So, here we see devices, layouts, settings, metrics. Basically, what this window is, is a literally window into the internals of the system. Metrics is just a bunch of numbers about, like, Actually, only three numbers, but, but stuff that goes on internally. Uh, settings is a dump of the values uh, of settings that you can actually configure now. Here, like these are the settings for the old input manager. We have a new tab now with the settings for the new system. Um, if you are fine with the defaults, you don't need to touch this. If you want to modify the defaults, you can create a settings asset. Uh, the settings are stored in, this, uh, in your project as a normal asset, uh, and then modify this here. And then we have layouts. This is what I, what I was referring to um, previously. Like, this is the extensible layout system. Basically, this branch here represents all the knowledge about controls and devices that the system has. And we can go and even like, look at, I don't know, on gamepads and maybe iOS gamepad. This layout completely describes to the system what a, a gamepad looks on iOS. Uh, but we can even go here in the editor and say, create a device for this, and bam, we have a device which looks exactly the same as it does on the device, uh, on, the, on iOS. Um, we can double click that and we get a, um, and a debugger window specifically for the device, um, which in this case, however, is pretty boring because there's no actual device and there's no one feeding events for this device. So let's look at this actually with a, a real piece of hardware. So I have an Xbox controller here and I can plug that one in, oh, USB always upside down, and there we go. Um, by the way, this notification that just came in that made the debugger realize there's a new device, it's a public API, you can listen to that, uh, and you will get a notification when a new device comes online or one is removed, that kind of stuff. 
So I can double click there. We see a bunch of information up here about the device. Um, and then in here in the middle section, we see the controls. And this is what I was referring to earlier. Um, a device is just a bunch of controls. And actually, it's a hierarchy of controls. So like here, we have the device at the top, the D-pad um, as its child, and then the uh, D-pad further breaks down in a bunch of buttons. OK? And all these controls have names. And you can see, for example, for the face buttons, like we named them by the cardinal directions to avoid any ambiguity like between uh, different kinds of naming schemes that different platforms employ. Um, so button south is guaranteed to be the bottommost face button on the gamepad. And using that name, it will, like this is immutable. This name always refers to that control. But we can also see in the second column here um, that they have a display name. So here, because this is an Xbox controller, we see A, because that's what they call on this particular piece of hardware. If I were to plug a DualShock controller in here, it would say cross. Um, and if we were to look at a keyboard, for example, all this would change depending on the keyboard layout, uh, because the display name depends on what the keyboard layout actually chooses to assign to that key. Um, so um, the display name gives you an easy way uh, to display proper names in the UI, whereas the internal name gives you a stable identifier that always finds the right control. So um, there's a bunch of other stuff here. It's mostly internal things and blah, blah. At the end here, in the last column, we have value. And this is a live view. Like I can go and actually, actually the left, light, um, left stick, sorry. And we see the value. And what we also see is here at the bottom, you can see that the events come streaming in. So it captures the events for us. We can even look at one and see the values coming in for it. We can see, like, this is the raw payload of the event. Oops. Don't know why this took a second to switch. Um, so uh, you can see from here, you can pretty much see exactly what is going on with a device. And this does uh, works not only locally, but also remotely. Uh, so I have a, uh, an iPad here, which is connected to this computer. And I can go on a remote devices and say, iPad. Oops. Um, I need to unlock it. It has locked itself by now. So, and now I should be able to connect. And as always, um, this is the part where it does not work. Um, <laughs> let me just quickly see if I can fix that by restarting this thing. If not, well, then uh, you have to believe me that it actually, like, at least sometimes works. Uh, so yeah, now we connected. I had to restart the application on the device for some reason. Um, we can now see the devices that this uh, devi um, devices that this uh, piece of hardware here has. Uh, we can, for example, open the touch screen. This is uh, the view on the state of the device uh, that it has here on the iPad. And I can go and I can uh, generate events here by, by operating the touch screen, updates live in the input debugger. Let me disconnect that here. And just to close this one out, uh, I mentioned that this is completely extensible. Um, so you can go in, like we have a sample here actually in the input system. The samples are found here directly in the uh, package window, and you can install them from here. We have a custom device sample. You can import that in project. Just a single C sharp file, heavily document, uh, commented, uh, recompiles there. Uh, now we have a custom device, and uh, it should actually show up in the input debugger, which I should have left open uh, here. And then custom devices. There's our custom device, um, completely extensible. Okay. So that was devices. And actually, it was um, live demo. OK. Next building block, actions. Uh, so actions are this high-level concept where you try to move away from um, tying your application code to specific inputs. Like, for example, querying specifically the spacebar key or the left stick on the gamepad. And instead, like, going a level up and operating in terms of logical stuff like jump or interact, 
and making your processing logic less concerned about where an input is coming from, but rather just that something is coming in. They're somewhat reminiscent of the old access concept and the, the old input system, but they're more flexible, fully rebindable, and lots of stuff. Um, so actions come with their uh, own new type of asset, along with a dedicated UI in the editor, but like, you can also make them up at runtime or, or like, modify them any which way you want. Uh, so uh, like they're fully accessible through the API. Um, they're based on a flexible binding system, which is fully reconfigurable at runtime. And there's even like out-of-the-box support to help you implement stuff like rebinding screens. That's the perform interactive rebinding you can see here, which is based on a flexible mechanism to just listen to for input. Um, there is support for control schemes. Um, so you can group bindings uh, into sets that make, uh, like in case your application can be operated in multiple different ways. Um, and finally, uh, the whole action system is built around an inter uh, extensible interaction model that supports patterns such as holds uh, and taps and that kind of stuff. And you can extend that and implement your own interactions as well. So same thing as before, let's jump back into Unity and look at this in action. So, uh, I said it's an asset, so you can create it the same way you create any other kind of asset. You go into Assets, Create. Um, it's done here, Input Actions, or click here. Right-click, Create. Oh, no, not Material Palette. Cannot delete, okay. I guess I had the wrong thing selected. Input Actions. Okay, um, let's name this some way. Sample Controls. Um, and I double-click it, and this is the uh, UI for editing actions. Looks pretty blank now because the asset is completely blank. A um, bit of terminology here. Uh, on the left, you see action maps. An action map is just a collection of actions. Um, can have arbitrary many actions. Um, the only requirement is that these actions have unique names, and also there can be arbitrary many action maps. In an asset, same thing. Only requirement is that they have unique names. Um, at, at runtime, like, um, for actions to actually do something, they have to be enabled, and like you have complete control over that. You can enable, disable sets arbitrarily, uh, multiple sets, single sets, wh whatever. Even individual actions uh, just from the action map instead of enabling the entire map. So let's, let's go in and create some stuff here. Let's say, okay, we have a, one map that represents our gameplay, and maybe just for fun, um, uh, well, let's call it maybe menu. Um, and uh, let's just come up with uh, some simple uh, set of actions that would, could make sense in a real application. So we could say, okay, um, let's say we have a simple game where you can move, look around, and interact with things, okay? So we have a move action, look, and interact, okay? And um, actions also have this thing, like, they have broad behavioral types. And right now, you can see that every single action is set to button, which makes sense for interact. Um, button doesn't really make sense for look at move, which is um, actions that we want to source values from. Um, and in particular, we want them to source um, vector two values, like planar 2D motion vectors. Um, so let's switch that. We can se set that here to value. We say vector two, and we do the same thing for look, okay? Value vector two, and there, like, that's our like, a sensible set of actions. Let's go on and actually bind this to some stuff. In particular, let's bind it to the gamepad, okay? And I said before, it's based on a flexible binding system. Um, it's actually a, a path language kind of that allows you to very flexibly identify controls at runtime. And you, like, we could switch this into text mode and, and enter some path here, but it would not be really any better than the old system where you had to do exactly that. Um, instead, we have this really nice new control picker here where we can go and actually pick controls from. So let's go and say gamepad. And you can see on the gamepad here, it only shows us three controls. Uh, because it only shows the ones that are relevant to the action and which we've already set to vector two on a gamepad, these are the only controls that can give you vector two values. Um, so that's what it shows. So let's go and bind this to the left stick, 
the move, the look, let's bind that to the right stick, and interact, uh, let's say this is the, um, um, the A button on the Xbox gamepad. Um, with that, we have a working set of controls for a gamepad. Now, let's say we want to extend that to have a keyboard and mouse support, okay? But we want to do that cleanly as a separate control scheme. We can do that up here and say, okay, well, we already have a gamepad scheme, right? Um, we add the gamepad as a required device to that, and now you can see it says global. The thing is, like, a binding that is not associated with any kind of control scheme is just active in all of them. So let's actually fix that and say, okay, all of these, they go into the um, gamepad control scheme, and now we have this one set up. We can go and add another one called keyboard and mouse. We can add the keyboard to it, and we can add the mouse to it. Um, it's empty because we have no bindings uh, yet for this, so let's fix that. Problem is, move already puts us in a conundrum. I, there's not, uh, no control on a keyboard that can give you vector two. What we want to do, however, is we want to have WASD, like all four keys, to act in unison to give us vector two. Um, we can't do this with a normal binding. It just binds to uh, one uh, type of source only. But we can do that with what's called a composite. So, Composites are um, a way for one binding to actually source its values from a number, any number of part bindings. And it sources the values from there, performs some computation, returns a single value. And this is completely extensible. We have a couple of composites that come with the system, but you can write your own. Uh, they plug right uh, into here. They are no different from the, the built-in ones. Um, the reason only one is shown here is that we have only one composite out of the box that delivers a vector two value. Again, it does filtering and tries to display to you only what really makes sense. So let's add this thing. Um, and we want this WSD, so let's call it WSD, okay? And then these bindings are the part bindings that source the values that the composite then uses. So this one we can bind to the W key. We could go in here and actually like look this up uh, in the list, but it's kind of um, tedious. Instead, we have this listen button here. And what listen does is just listens for controls that you actuate and that actually fit what you're looking for. So you could uh, just hack some, uh, or use some keys here and they all show up. So let's um, hit W and bind to that. So with that, it should go pretty quick. We say, okay, this is the S key. Left is the A key, and right is the D key, okay? Um, with that, we have a working WASD setup. Um, but now, let's say you, you also want the arrow keys to do the same thing. We could go and just add another composite here and set that up for arrows, or we could go, just go and say, okay, well, duplicate this um, and set this one to left arrow. Um, Semantically, it gets slightly different in how it works. Now there's a single composite instead of two, uh, but a fully valid setup here. And I, I could go and do this for the other ones, but um, that would be boring. So um, that was composites in a nutshell. For look, it's simple. We don't need a composite. Like We want to bind that to the delta uh, control on the mouse, and that is already a vector too. So we just add a binding here, go on the mouse, select delta, that's it. Interact, let's bind it to the E key on the keyboard. Um, and we're set. We have a fully working um, control scheme for keyboard and mouse. Now, let's say we, we don't like the fact that uh, when you hit the interact button, it immediately triggers. Like, in many games, it leads to like you accidentally triggering. Actually, you just walk through the world and you happen to have, hit the interact button and poof, it goes off. So what many games do is they actually um, uh, require you to hold the button for a bit before the interaction is started. Um, so let's say we want to do that. We could go here on the E key and add a hold interaction, um, but that would only apply to the E key. So let's do that at the level of the action. Um, here, we can add a hold. So now, uh, interact only triggers once the button is held. Here we have a default time of uh, 0 0.4 seconds. Uh, we can customize that. By the way, you also get a callback when the button goes down, not just once the action is complete. So if you want to have UI feedback and like display a circle that is charging up or that kind of stuff, uh, you get a callback that you can listen for uh, and uh, then kick off the UI feedback. Um, 
So uh, that's the interactions in a nutshell. Again, inter extensible system, couple interactions come out of the box. You can write your own. Uh, and they all show up here. Um, and uh, as before, like you can go in the package manager, like there's a sample for a custom composite as well. Uh, custom binding composite shows up there. And also just to note that um, the, the custom device we previously added um, also shows up here in the control picker. Uh, is that the wrong, does it not have a button? Uh, I'm not sure anymore what kind of control it actually has. Oh, I'm in the game, a keyboard and mouse control scheme, so it filters out the custom device because it is not a keyboard and not, oops, uh, not a mouse. So in here, I can go back and say, it appears you have a custom device and I can bind to that, okay? So they appear just as native as anything else in the system. Okay, that was actions. Let me switch back here. Um, this thing, and that brings us to the final key building block of the new input system. So, the thing is, once we had actions up and running, um, we looked at the thing and looked how users are using it, and one thing that became obvious pretty quickly is that it takes a lot of steps to set things up, um, especially if you go from scratch, uh, and especially also if you have like more complicated cases like local multiplayer, in case, like, that doesn't mean anything to you. Local multiplayer, we refer to like a game that where multiple players are playing on the same instance of the game on the same machine, where as opposed to like multiplayer where you have separate instances of the game on separate machines and they're wired together over a network. Um, so we looked at that setup cost and we thought, okay, how can we make the system so that you can get started super quickly and you still have access to um, like, like all the, the, the juicy bits uh, and um, basically the, the, the power that the new system brings. And that is player input. Player input is a mono behavior component um, that takes care of a whole bunch of things automatically, like for example, automatic control scheme switching. Oops, uh, falling a bit behind here. Um, uh, in single player, like let's say your game has a, a number of control schemes. And in single player mode, you want the player to be able to just freely go from one to the other. Like keyboard mouse, you should be able to just pick up the gamepad and play. And the uh, system will detect that, it will automatically inform the application, stuff like that. Um, so that you can update your UI hands, for example, uh, and switch out the icons that you displace, things like that. Um, also, um, one of the very reasons that exists, easy local multiplayer. It's simple. Every single player input instance simply represents one player. If you instantiate multiple, you have multiple players. Simple as that. And every player gets uh, a specific, uh, like a set of devices specific to that player. Um, related to that, um, for doing things like joins and split screen and that stuff, we also have another component that allows you to, do, uh, gives you a quick start for this kind of logic. Um, again. Let me switch over real quick, and let's look at this in action, okay? Let's save this thing. Oh, I actually forgot to show you one thing. Oh, let me just real quick mention that. Like, um, this, uh, the actions that we previously authored, they're fully functional, um, but like, you probably remember in the old system, you had to then go and actually look everything up by, by string names at runtime. It was really brittle. You don't need to do that in the new system. We have the ability to generate a C-sharp class that just wraps around the entire thing. Um, when you play that here in the uh, inspector importer settings, um, you get a C-sharp file. It's self-contained, no longer depends on the asset. You can instantiate that however many times, uh, and it does all the lookups for you. They're type safe. If you rename an action, your API breaks, and you get a compile error. Um, so that's what I forgot. OK, let's switch back to player input. So um, let's say we want to create a player here, OK? So this game object should become our player. So we just add the guy, and we add player input. And with that, to the input system, this represents one player. This thing is not fully functional yet. We have no actions. A player needs to have a set of actions that belong to the player. So we could go and actually drag the actions that we just authored in there. But let's say we, we don't have them. We're starting from scratch. Um, in the old system, 
you have this thing where like, you have some pre-configured stuff, right, that makes sense for at least some kinds of applications. So you're not starting from scratch uh, with a blank thing. We can do the same here and say, create actions, we just give them a name, um, bam, and it gives us a pre-populated list that has a number of control schemes um, and a number of bindings in place just to get you started quickly and not have you start from scratch every time. Okay, um, then over here, we could select the default uh, uh, control scheme. It would then start out with that and try that first. But if we don't select any, just go through the list, sees what devices are available. So we don't need to make a selection here. What we do want to select is, thing is, I mentioned before that actions need to be enabled to actually like, actively listen for input. Um, if we don't do that uh, and assign a default action map here, nothing gets enabled by default. We can do that manually, but if we don't want to, uh, we can just select one and the player will go enable that action map when it is um, itself enabled. And then finally, we have a uh, like behavior thing here. We have multiple ways in which we can react to input, uh, multiple ways in which player input can tell us that something happened. Um, here, let, let's just switch that to events. Uh, look in there, and um, we, like, I, I don't want to do any scripting here. I think that that's boring to watch. Uh, but what we can do is we can just wire it up to um, the player itself. It has a debug function on it. So every time we trigger the move action, the player, uh, th there will be something in the console, right? So here. And there uh, we have a fully functioning player. We can actually look at that guy in the debugger. Let me pop that back up. Let's actually dock it here. Uh, we can see users. Uh, it's also mentioned down here. Um, the play input implicitly creates an input user. And the input user is what holds like the paired devices and all that kind of stuff. We can see the, the actions that the user has, all that stuff. And if I actually go and duplicate the player here. Now we have uh, basically a local, co uh, local multiplayer, and we can see that the second guy ended up with the gamepad because there were no more keyboards and mice available. Um, so we now have one player controlling the game with uh, keyboard and mouse and the other controlling it with gamepad. Now, let's say this is like a bit uncoordinated. Let's say we want players to join explicitly. Um, we can also hook that up pretty easily. We can create another object here, say, um, that this is our player manager. Uh, we put the other component on there. Um, now this guy needs a prefab. Um, I can just drag this guy in here, uh, delete it from the scene, and give it a prefab. And now if I go into play mode, um, I can join one player. You can see it on the right in the debugger from keyboard and mouse. Join a second player from the gamepad. Um, easy joining behavior. Um, also, just to mention that, uh, I won't really demonstrate that, but there's also support for split screen. We could set up a camera on the player uh, and then enable split screen here and it would automatically subdivide the, the screen area. Um, so, that's it for um, this part. Like, these were the key building blocks for the remaining slides, I'd just like to real quickly go um, and touch on various feature areas and highlight just some key aspects for each, okay? Let's start with touch. Right now, we have uh, two levels of support for touch. The basis of all touch in the new input system is the touchscreen device, which is fully bindable from actions and works the same way as any other device. Uh, in addition, we have a separate polling API that is meant as to be a superior alternative to the old input systems touch API. It has support for touch recognition, um, for touch histories, easier finger tracking, primary touches, bunch of stuff. Um, one thing we do not yet have, though, is gesture support. This is high on the list of want to have things, so yeah, stay tuned there. Gamepads and joysticks. For gamepads, we decided to roll out with support for just the most common controllers as a first step, meaning Xbox slash X input controllers and PlayStation controllers, and on Switch, also the Switch controller controllers. Um, the, the idea here is to first get everything solid in 1.0 and then go broad. 
Um, for these gamepads, we also support Rumble, dual motor Rumble in general, and uh, dual plus trigger motor Rumble on the Xbox One. Um, side note for consoles, support for NDA platforms, meaning Xbox, uh, PlayStation, and Switch, does not come packaged with the input system itself, but rather through dedicated packages made available directly to license holders. Uh, it's just, you know, the joy of NDA stuff. Uh, besides gamepad support, uh, we also have support for generic HIDs. In case that just a meaningless acronym to you, HID stands for Human Interface Device, and basically it's a standard uh, built on top of USB and later adapted for Bluetooth uh, for uh, doing input devices. Uh, if you're looking at an input device, chances are it's an HID. Um, thing is, HID, oops. Um, HIDs have a way of describing themselves, and we can use that information to automatically generate a layout even when we do not have a hand tailored layout specifically for the device. Unfortunately, the descriptions are, they're not very precise, so sometimes it's up to guesswork. Uh, we have a fallback in place that does exactly that uh, to turn HID joysticks and HID gamepads uh, we don't specifically recognize into devices in the input system. Mouse and pen, not that much to say here. Uh, for mouse, pen, and touch, there is a new pointer abstraction that essentially unifies the three types of devices into uh, a model that allows you uh, to treat these devices interchangeably. Um, and then for pen and tablet support, which also encompasses stylus support on mobiles, um, we report things such as pressure and tilt levels, so like how hard the pre uh, pen is pressed against the surface and uh, how it is tilted uh, against the surface of the tablet or uh, whatever device. Keyboard. Uh, there are actually a couple interesting things. So, for one, keyboard support in the new input system is based on mapping keys by their physical location, which means that if you set up WASD as we did before, uh, we guarantee you that those keys are in the right location regardless of keyboard layout. So if we talk about what we call the A key, it is always the key to the right of the caps lock key. Um, but if you want to, you can also bind by um, what character key, uh, the key generates. Um, we support that as well, uh, which means that if the layout changes, the key may be in a completely different location or may even not be on the keyboard at, at all. Um, and then finally, we have uh, a no-heap garbage uh, text input path uh, that delivers text input character by character. So if you, for example, do a typing game, you can do that without incurring GC spikes implicitly from just picking up text input. Um, and yeah, feature-wise, there's a bunch of other things that I'd just like to point out real quick and go through. Um, we have support for sensors like gyros, accelerometers, uh, gravity sensors, and so on and so forth. Um, these are normal devices, uh, so you can bind to them from actions, you can uh, make up input for them, uh, uh, whatever you want. Um, we have support for XR devices, like Vives and Oculuses and whatever. Uh, same deal, it comes as, out as regular devices that looks like everything else in the system, uh, which also means that unlike in the old system, um, tracking button and access data for a track de uh, XR device comes out the same single way instead of on, on separate APIs. Um, note that the, the XR support for specific devices is packaged separately. Um, so. For Oculus, for example, you'll, you need to install the uh, Oculus-specific package, and that comes with support for the new input system. This has been a re very recent change, uh, and I'm not sure that their latest packages are updated yet, uh, but if that hasn't happened yet, it's going to happen uh, very, very, very soon. Um, then, we have support for UGUI, of course. Uh, there's a new input module that replaces standalone input module and has support for keyboard mouse input, uh, uh, gamepad navigation and touch uh, and all that stuff. It's based on actions, so it's fully rebindable and you can customize it to your liking. Um, to use it, simply select the event system that uh, Unity sets up automatically uh, and on the um, standalone input module the component, you will see a button to replace it. Simple as that. Uh, tied to that, we also have support for per user uh, UI. So if you have a split screen setup, for example, where every user has a custom menu just on that uh, very, uh, the user's own split screen, uh, we support that as well now. Um, and then um, 
We have support for on-screen controls, which are typically used to, like, for virtual joysticks uh, on, on mobile titles. But in this case, it's not restricted to that. Like, uh, these controls, they can be used to feed input for any arbitrary input device. Um, we have support for editor window code, so like on GUI, for example. So you can use all the devices that the input system surfaces, all the input there. You can use that to tie that to editing logic as well. Um, and last but definitely not least, we ha also have support for writing automated tests involving input. And we use that ourselves. We have hundreds of automated tests uh, that use that very, same, uh, very feature. Um, it comes as a separate DLL as part of the input system package uh, and a separate API called input test fixture, which completely isolates the input system and puts it in a known state, and then your test can drive it however, however you want. Um, so uh, we're pretty much at the end. We've looked a bit, quite a bit at what's there. So let's close this out at, uh, and look at what's not there. Right. Um, first big ticket item is the old input system. I mentioned that right now they live side by side. And from the get-go, the intention was to not think about deprecation of the old system until we have a system that we can rightfully say it fully replaces the old one. We're slowly getting to that point, and uh, like, we don't have a definitive plan at the moment how we're going to do it, but ultimately, the old input system will be deprecated and will be removed. Um, there's DOTS and ECS. The new input system at this point has no dedicated support for ECS. Like any main thread API, you can uh, pick up input in your component systems on update function um, and then route the input there from there into jobs. Uh, we have something called manual update mode that you can switch the system into, which decouples the input system from the player loop and you can just run input updates uh, under your own control. But beyond um, 1.0, we will take a look at uh, integrating input more natively with dots. Um, Another big thing uh, is broadening device support, especially with respect to gamepads and the like. Uh, we still have pretty limited support. So beyond 1.0, we want to broaden that support um, to a point where many more devices have custom tailored layouts, um, devices such as racing wheels and flight sticks, and so on. Um, and finally, there is stuff that uh, didn't make it into 1.0. Uh, the aforementioned Gesture support is one, but there's also holes like uh, stuff like um, multi-display support, multi-pointer support. So there is still work to do. Um, okay, and I think that's the last one. Yep. Um, just to give you a couple pointers in case you want to dig in deeper and learn more uh, about this stuff. Um, here's a couple resources. Uh, first. Um, they already made an appearance here and there in the talk. We have samples that can be installed directly from the package manager. They can be very useful to look at. Um, then we have documentation, which can also be accessed directly from the package manager. Just click that view documentation link. Um, we're still refining things. You will likely find typos, uh, and you will probably also find a hole here and there. We're still working on that, but there's already a lot there. Um, then. Uh, if you have questions or feedback, uh, we also have a section in the forum. Feel free to post there. It's a good way to reach, uh, to reach us directly. Um, finally, there's a GitHub repo if you want to follow development of the system or even contribute. I mean, we accept PRs as well. The repo contains the entire contents of the package. Uh, it's completely open source, um, and it's actually where all development happens. Like It's not just a mirror of something. It's where we actually work. Um, oops. Uh, also, uh, in case you come across bugs, um, the recommended way is to just use the, the normal Unity bug reporter, file a report through there, and it will reach us. Um, ideally, with the repro case, that's always super appreciated. Um, also, just to note that we have a kiosk here uh, at Unite in the hub area uh, for the input system. In case you have questions, you can head over there, uh, uh, and yeah, we'll be there. And. That is it. So give the new system a try if, you, if you'd like, and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, yeah, and otherwise, just, uh, guys, have a great day, and like, thanks a lot for, for sitting here and like, listening to me. Thanks, guys. <laughs>